All right, friends, another good day to you, another daily devotions, and we are now, it is June 12th, and we are looking at chapters 38 and 39. We're getting to the end of the book, which will finish tomorrow, but for today, we do 38 and 39, and we begin now Job, or, or God's speech, out of the whirlwind, and this is, this is, in my opinion, some of the finest ancient poetic literature in existence. Um, just its loftiness, its language, um, and, and just uh, how it goes about uh, expressing many of the themes of Job in this poetic fashion, and particularly the issue of wisdom, because that's been an issue throughout Job, is Job wise. Um, if Job were wise, he would know he's suffering for a reason. So there's this conversation about wisdom, and here comes God now to finally, after all this time, respond with his wisdom and show that there is a greater wisdom, in fact, a divine wisdom <clears throat> that perhaps Job nor anyone else can really understand. So let's get into those two chapters for today. So this is, of course, the climax of the book. Uh, God appears to Job in a theophany, a divine revelation, if you will. Often uh, theophanies are accompanied by thunder and lightning um, <clears throat> just on the mountain when Moses is on the Mount, Mount Sinai getting the law. Um, but what's real interesting is, is that when God responds to Job, he doesn't answer Job's questions that, that Job has been posing throughout the book. Uh, instead, what he does is he reveals to him something of divine wisdom. And it's the wisdom whereby the cosmos the universe was created, and we will get more of this idea of wisdom um, <clears throat> at creation uh, in Proverbs. It's actually a theme, too, that we get in the New Testament. Um, so uh, what you got here is in these, in these, there's two God speeches here. We're looking at the first one today. There's two God speeches here, and they describe the indescribable. They attempt to make sense of what cannot be made sense of, and that is the mystery of creation and all of its coming into being and all of its existence. <clears throat> it is certainly something that is too powerful, too vast for any human being to grasp. And so uh, the divine, these divine speeches, these responses, <clears throat> present to us poetic verbal descriptions of the cosmos where chaos and creation meet, uh, the mysterious place far from where humans live, where darkness turns to dawn, where snow and hail are stored, and where the wild and exotic animals go about their lives. The purpose of these speeches really is not to frighten Job, but rather to lift Job to a new level of reality, a new level of understanding. It's, in a, it's a sense to give Job, <clears throat> as much as is humanly possible, a God's eye view of the universe, where all things, even suffering and death, have their place and need no justification. So from a human perspective, it's not a perfect place, you know, because it includes elements of chaos, which even though even chaos is under God's control, it continues to be present in the universe and in life. And Job's been experiencing lots of chaos. Um, but even the elements of chaos are cared for by God. It's almost as if even the disorder is ordered by God. Um, so there is a sense in which you could say, well, this, these, these divine speeches are somewhat, somewhat scary if, uh, if you think about it. But then there's also something about knowing that in the midst of what we cannot control, God is in control. So um, these speeches reassure Job uh, that the world was indeed created through divine wisdom, and it continues to operate that way. It's not uh, now out of hand because of Job's suffering. So this first speech, <clears throat> which runs from 38 to 39, and then after that, we get a short response from Job in chapter 40. The speech is continued. This next second speech takes place, and then another short response from Job. 
Um, but uh, the description of creation uh, moves in a general way, <clears throat> the founding of the universe to celestial bodies, to mete meteorological phenomenon, and then to uh, wild and exotic fauna, um, and also then animals, uh, even uh, uh, the war horse and two creatures, behemoth, and Leviathan, uh, who, who, who are Behemoth and Leviathan. Leviathan, some believe, is the whale, but these large, large animals uh, that, uh, that roam the world or, or uh, live in the ocean. Uh, and the description here is highly poetic, as, was, as we've seen if we've read it. And, and it highlights how God understands and cares for his creation, and that Job cannot. Job does not understand creation, nor does he know how to care for it on a large scale. Um, <clears throat> so in God's first speech, he uh, sets Job's lack of knowledge against God's perfect knowledge. Um, and again, it's, it talks about the creation of the world and its ongoing care. It begins with the creation of the universe, the control over sea, the creation even of light. Um, and then we get, again, the meteorological uh, happenings, constellations, uh, even talking about where the rain comes from. Uh, and finally, speaking of wild animals, mountain goats and birds of prey and, and wild asses, um, uh, whose ways only God understands and God cares for. Um, and so uh, God responds to Job's challenge in this speech with a challenge of his own. He echoes Elihu here. God declares that Job's lack of knowledge um, it, is the examination that, that follows will prove. So where was Job uh, is the question, and we get rhetorical questions here as we've gotten throughout the book. Where was Job when God created the universe? Job, where were you, God says, in a society that prized antiquity? Uh, the first question shows that Job is a newcomer uh, into the world. And even if he was around from the beginning, he would not have been able to construct creation in the way God did. How, Job, where, where were you? Were you there? Tell me, you are so old. You've been around such a long time, Job. These rhetorical, somewhat sarcastic questions that God asks, raises for Job, that God doesn't expect an answer because the answer is already known. Uh, so there's kind of another thing about God restraining the sea, the primordial waters of chaos. Uh, this is a major feature in creation imagery in the ancient Near Eastern world. Uh, powerful forces uh, of evil that need to be prevented and need to be held at bay to keep them from overrunning the world and overrunning creation. Um, and the sea... Uh, which is often uh, depicted as uh, the place of evil and powerful as it is, is here likened to a newborn whom God swaddles in his clothes and, and God swaddles in the clouds. So think again about the power of water, the power of the sea, but the God who created that water holds that powerful, dangerous, deadly, sometimes deadly water in his hands the way parent would hold a newborn babe. It's, uh, it's an interesting, interesting image. Um, Job's never been to the far reaches of the cosmos. He's never traversed the cosmos. He therefore has no direct experience of it. Um, and uh, snow and hail and wind and all of these things, ice, Job doesn't know the origin of where these things come from. He doesn't know how to direct them. And uh, even the rain, even the rain falls in the desert where no one lives. So God is imagined as a parent, a father, a mother uh, to the various forms of water that exist. 
the constellations, they rise in the sky, they move in their positions. Job lacks the wisdom to do any of this, to know how any of this works and how to send the rain to water the earth. Uh, he's unable to provide any kind of sustenance to the universe. Um, you have the imagery here of clouds as being uh, rain bowls, bowls of rain uh, that pour water upon the earth. And uh, God provides for the wild animals, the birds who live far from human beings and uh, the lion and the raven uh, are able to provide for themselves. And yet the point is, it's still God who gives them food. Uh, so, there's, so, so in this great big speech, this imagery, God is saying to Job, Job, you just don't know. You just don't know. Um, there is a mystery here. There is a mystery to creation. There's a mystery of life. Uh, it isn't that there are not answers this side of eternity, but there's also a great mystery to what happens. And there is, and there, and there is no necessary explanation, even though we would like it sometimes, but God has created and God sustains and there are just times where that has to be sufficient for human beings. Um, and Job is no more responsible for the instinctive behavior of animals uh, than he is for the behavior of other people, even his friends sitting around the campfire with him. This is the world that God has made. It's got its own rules. Um, and Job uh, cannot understand it. And uh, if Job cannot understand the natural world, if Job cannot understand the world of the animals and the world of rain and sleet and the world of the oceans, then how is he going to understand how God relates to human beings, including to him in his own suffering uh, and in his own difficulties. So that's where we end the first speech. We will finish up tomorrow with chapters 40, which, uh, we'll which begins with Job's first brief response to this first speech of God. And then uh, we get a second speech and a brief response. And then we get an epilogue, which is kind of interesting uh, to ponder. All right, friends, let's pray. Gracious God, Thank you for the gift of this wonderful day. Thank you for your presence. And there's so many things in life that are mystery. Uh, help us to be seekers because you have given us our minds to seek after, but also help us to know when to be content, to know that there are things for which there is no explanation, at least this side of eternity. But in all things, help us to trust in you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Hasta mañana.